filament runout sensors can be useful, but also a bit clunky. Today, we test one with Smarts, the efficient and convenient orbiter filament sensor with automatic heating and loading and one button auto heating and unloading. The truth is, not many of these 3D printers that I use have filament runout sensors fitted. It's not that I don't like them, it's more that I find them inconvenient to pass filament through, so I end up just plugging them up. And then, inevitably, I ruin a print from running out of filament. My patron Derek posted about the Orbiter filament sensor, a 3D printer upgrade with the smarts to automate loading and unloading. He follows my journey in getting it installed, with a few minor fixes and tips along the way. Let's start by looking at what this product is. The Orbiter filament sensor is actually made for the Orbiter. This is another product by the author Robert, currently at version 2.0. In essence, it's a very compact and lightweight extruder. If you'd like to learn more, I made a dedicated video on this extruder in its version 1 form where I fitted it to a second SK Go. I liked the Orbiter so much that I again chose it for my Ratrig B Core 3 build. And I haven't been disappointed. It's worked flawlessly ever since, being capable of producing stunning high quality prints when required, as well as being able to extrude filament at a crazy rate fast enough to produce this 8.5 minute speed benchy. So as you can see, the Orbiter filament sensor is designed to go on top of the Orbiter. However, if we scroll down, we can see that it's completely open source, including all of the CAD files, so even if you don't have an Orbiter, if you're handy with CAD, you can buy the base electronics and then model the housing to suit your particular extruder. Another good thing for me is that I'm running an older Orbiter 1.0 and this sensor supports it as well as version 1.5 and the newest version 2.0. The other thing to consider is that this sensor is designed for RepRap firmware and Clipper, which I'll be covering in this video. Marlin can be supported but it's very limited and not recommended. When it comes to purchasing, we have several options. The first is to make everything yourself. We have a full bill of material for electronic components, mechanical components, as well as the PCB Gerber files. If you're buying a kit like I did, you'll need to be aware of which version Orbiter that you're using. I purchased my kit locally from Unique Prints in Australia. My Orbiter is version 1, and a version 1.5 filament sensor kit was able to be fitted with minimal changes. If you have a newer Orbiter, you can buy a version of the kit that comes with a printed housing included, and this is only a few dollars more. Let's proceed with step-by-step -step installation. Firstly, the housing. The kit I purchased was for an Orbiter 1.5, so it didn't have the printed housing, but it still came with the electronics cabling, the actual filament sensor PCB, as well as the mechanical hardware. So we come to the project page, scroll down, until we reach the 3D design file segment. Now it's just a matter of downloading the version that you require. If you are using the electronics with a different extruder, you can open up the step file and modify it to suit. I would suggest retaining the section where the filament goes through as it houses the ball bearing which presses on the switch and also the section on top with the unload button. There's also the output for the electronics plug, but beyond that, the rest of the housing and these mounting tabs you're going to need to customize. If you're pairing this sensor with an orbiter, it's simply a matter of printing the housing. This light guide component had a clear injection molded version included in my kit, but if you do need to print it yourself, make sure you do it in a clear filament too, because this part needs to be clear so that the status LED can illuminate it. For the actual housing, it needs to be spun around to put the flat surface on the bed. However, I had trouble here because I noticed in the CAD that the raised section of this A sits above the rest of the surface. So when I did print mine, Part of it wasn't fully pressed against the build surface, but that didn't seem to matter in the end. The other thing you'll need is support material to cover this mounting lug, as well as the opening on the underside. Beyond that, the housing is not a particularly tricky print, and the rat rig that it will be fitted to had no problems producing it. And when the print is done, the only work required is removing the support material, the trickier of the two being the hole on the underside. You also need to check if filament can fit through the filament path, for me, it was a little bit tight, so I opened this up with a 2mm drill bit, which seems to have been ideal. On to assembly, and our first step is to take the ball bearing from the hardware packet and insert it into the cavity in the printed housing. It's hard to show it here, but there's only one place it really fits. Next, we need to insert the PCB, 
We can get the general orientation by lining up the port for the wiring as well as the unload button on top. At the time of recording, there was no instructions for this part, so I relied heavily on referencing the CAD model. You can see that there's a channel on either side for the PCB to slot into, and then we have this flexible arm that should move out of the way as it slides in and flex down to retain it. The other reference we have for when it's fully inserted is the unload button sitting just proud on top. In reality, I found I was really bad at this. I found it really hard to find the right angle because of that flexible arm being in the way. I guess ultimately I was worried about snapping it, but once I got over that and I grabbed something to lever it out of the way, I began to progress much more quickly. Even so, I still had to push the PCB way harder than I expected to slide it into its final resting position. I guess if it goes wrong and you snap the housing, it's not too big a deal to just print another one. After a couple of minutes of struggling, I did manage to get it in its final position and I was ready to proceed. Next up is the light guide. It simply presses into the top. I found mine a little bit tight, so I gave it a little persuasion. It wasn't the whole way in, but it was good enough for what I wanted. Next up, installation onto the print head. And this is going to vary depending on the version of the orbiter that you're using. For me, I needed to remove the spring from the tension arm in order to access the top bolt. Then it's simply a matter of unscrewing this as well as the lower bolt. These bolts hold the whole assembly together with the stepper motor at the back. Our pre-assembled filament sensor simply slides over the top of the orbiter and hopefully your two mounting holes line up like mine did. Before you bolt anything back together, it's important to ensure that you have a smooth filament path as the loading will be automatic and you don't want any jams. If you do find a sticking point that likes to jam, remove the filament sensor with the filament still in position, you'll see how much it's hanging through and therefore where it's jamming. In my case, I hadn't added any PTFE tube to guide the filament from where it exits the sensor into the entrance of the orbiter extruder. I put a short length in, marked how much needed to be cut off, and then reinserted the piece leaving the top flush. If you're happy with everything, the kit should come with two longer M3 screws that we reinsert exactly how the old ones were holding everything together. Looking from the front, one on the lower left and one on the upper right. I did notice a problem at this stage and that's that the lever arm couldn't fully close. It is subtle, but the upper right bolt was fouling on the lever arm. Hopefully this view from the top shows it much clearer. As you can see, the lever arm is catching on the top of frame and this will stop it from gripping the filament. The fix in my case was simple enough. I marked with a sharpie the area that was touching the bolt and then I got a grinder and gave it a little bit of relief. Keep in mind I'm using an Orbiter version 1 and any of the newer designs probably won't have this trouble. Next up is preliminary wiring and I would recommend plugging in the supplied loom into the back of the filament sensor and then deciding how you want to route it back to the main board from there. The path for me seemed pretty obvious so it was just a matter of modifying my existing cable management system to include these new wires. On the Ratrig V-Core 3, once I had routed these to the main board, the pre-made loom was an ideal length to reach anywhere on the main board. To plug these wires in, you're going to need to find a reference diagram for your main board to identify any free pins. In my case, I had a conflict, because the recommended supply voltage is 3.3, and these are readily available on the unused end stop ports. However, the signal pin for each of these ports is connected to a pull-up resistor and as the instructions warn, you might have troubles which I did. But stupidly, I already committed to cutting and rewiring the loom, crimping on JST connectors to match the end stop port. So rather than deciding on your final connection without testing like I did here, I would recommend at this stage just loosely plugging the connectors into the potential ports and at first only the two power pins, which will give you a chance to see if the unit is powered properly and the LED colored as it should be. We can then also plug in the green and yellow wires and move on to firmware. The firmware instructions are on the same page and we have a section for RepRap or in my case, if I keep scrolling down, a section for Clipper. And our first step is to click and download the orbitersensor.cfg file. Once we have, we can switch to our Clipper configuration and drag this file to add it to the rest of the configuration files. We then click to open it where we need to make a minimum of two changes and they are the two input pins that you're connecting the green and yellow wires to. The first one I used was PD0, so I switched back to the Clipper configuration file, and under the section G-code button sensor FS, I input this pin there. For the yellow wire, the pin I used was PE4. So in the section G-code button sensor FU, I enter this pin and then I can save the file. 
To finalize the changes in your main printer.cfg file, we need to include a reference to the Orbiter Sensor file, and we do that inside square brackets with include and then orbitersensor.cfg. In your extruder section, double check you have a setting called min extrude temp. 170 is a good value for this if you don't. And then finally, a section called force underscore move with enable force move set to true. And that's because the macros use force move, but this won't work without it being enabled elsewhere in the configuration. With all of these changes in place, click to save and restart the firmware. Everything should be live, so let's test. With no temperature set, we can test loading filament. Simply insert the filament into the top of the sensor, which should indicate green with the LED. The printer will then immediately start to heat up. And once it does reach full temperature, the extruder will push the filament 200 millimeters through the hot end. You can test the unload by pressing the button. The hot end will come up to temp if necessary and then back out the filament. Finally, our core functionality, which is detecting filament runout mid print. Once the end of the filament reaches the switch, printing will pause, the print head will park, and the unload sequence will immediately begin, backing out the filament, ready for us to remove the filament stub once it's free. During this process, we will receive prompts in the console and on the printer's display. Even though we're halfway through a print, the auto loading will work in exactly the same way. We enter the new filament, it will be grabbed, and then shortly after, the new filament will be pulled in and extruded through the hot end. Once this is done, we can remove the excess filament with some tweezers and hit resume on the printer's interface, where hopefully it will pick up exactly where it left off, giving us convenient filament runout protection. If the sensor buttons aren't running the macros automatically, you can pull out the temporary wiring, try somewhere else and update the firmware. If both buttons are working as they should be, now is a good time to finalize your wiring if needed. In my case, that meant cutting off the JST connectors I had added Recrimping DuPont connectors and plugging in the connector properly on the extension 2 port. Let's now assume you want to understand and possibly customize the macros that make this all work. The first thing to understand is that this filament sensor is not a typical sensor as set up by Clipper. Normally we would have a section called filament switch sensor, tell it which pin it was connected to, and then some commands for what happens when the filament runs out or is inserted. This product instead is simply two buttons, but set up to use macros to achieve the same purpose. The two buttons are set up as exactly that, G-code buttons. The supplied code tells the firmware which pins the buttons are connected to, and what we want to happen when they're either pressed or released. For instance, for the button on top of the sensor, if we press and release it, it will check if a print is underway. If it's not, it'll run a filament unload macro, and if it is, it'll give us a warning that we can't unload the filament mid-print. Elsewhere, we can find the filament load and filament unload macros, and here's where we can make any changes if we want to. The first thing you might like to change is the temperature that the hot end goes to to change filament, the default being 235, which is intended to be a jack of all trades. The second common thing you might want to change is how much filament is extruded. For instance, if you're using a Bowden tube, the default 200 millimeters might need to be extended. Here we have the filament unload macro, again, the temperature of 235, and then the movements for when the filament is pulled out. I noticed on unload, I was getting a little blob that would jam in the PTFE tube, so I modified the macro to push a little bit of filament in first before quickly retracting it and then slowly pulling out the rest. And I also increased the distance to 100 because it wasn't backing out enough to clear the hobbed gears. And here's a new sequence in play. The filament goes forward very fast and then quickly retracts before backing out slowly. This means that the filament won't be molten and getting stuck inside. When it's finished, I can pull it out without any jams because the tip is a lot more streamlined. Robert's macros are the heart of the functionality. They are complex, but most people should still be able to make small changes to suit their needs. One more thing, if you're running input shaping, the moving mass of the print head has changed, so please take the time to calibrate it again. If you think these clunky sensors have had their days and it's time to 3D printer manufacturers fitted something smarter, then let me know in the comments section. Also let me know if you're planning to buy this kit and fit it to a printer that isn't the Orbiter. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy efficient 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.